All right, let's go for my personal best time. Woo! Sorry, I just had to hit the whopper button there. Hey everyone, it's good to see you. I'm Noah, and welcome to Arcade Games. And no, that record talk wasn't just a joke. It's because after having talked about arrays, there's not much more to learn before you're an expert at lists. The second of the three collections we'll be talking about in this miniseries. By the end of this video, you'll know what lists are, how to declare them, how to add to them, how to remove from them, how to manage them, and exactly how they work under the hood. So, let's get going, let's get you in and out, because you've got to get that big brain swole. List. A set of indexed data that can be added to or removed from. So like an array that can do things. You'll interact with lists very much like you interact with arrays. The main difference is going to be in the declaration. First, you must make sure that you are including the system.collections.generic namespace at the top of your script. Do you remember what including these namespaces does? I'll talk for a second more just to fill in the gap for folks who may have to think about it for a second. Okay, so namespaces are a way of organizing our code and sharing it between files. The code for lists is located in the system.collections.generic namespace, which is a namespace native to the C-sharp language, so it should be available to you wherever you're programming in C-sharp. Down below where we want our list, we start with the data type list. If this is a member field, a member field being a class level variable, be sure to include the access modifier before the list keyword. So in our array declarations, we started with the data type we wanted to store, not the word array. While different here, it should be noted that the way list does it is standard and array is the weird one. Next, I've got something new for you. A float data type in between less than and greater than symbols. This is a syntax thing you'll see pop up in C Sharp throughout your Godot scripting and indicates a class or method that handles generic types. Generic types are an advanced concept, so we won't be going over them in depth in this series, but you do need to be comfortable with working with them, even as a beginner. So for now, think of it like this. Some classes and methods in C Sharp can manage any data type you throw at them, but they have to be told what data type they'll be dealing with. The horizontal chevrons, or less than or greater than symbols, is how you tell them. So this code is telling our program we want a list of floats. What do you suppose comes next? If you were thinking the name, you got it. This is a method level declaration, so we'll forgo the underscore since it's not a private member variable. But we'll call this one float list. Now we just type the equal sign, the keyword new, followed by parentheses and a semicolon. There we are. We now have a list of floats that we have not yet initialized. Here's the thing though, a non-initialized list simply means we have an empty list. Remember, with arrays, we had to declare the size up front. We don't have to do that with lists. So with arrays, if we didn't initialize the elements, we'd have all zeros or falses or empty strings or null objects. With lists, we simply have a list with nothing in it. If we knew what we wanted to put in our list as default values though, we can do that by adding some curly braces after the new with our list of values. Lastly, if we are initializing the list at the method level or deeper, we can initialize it using an array, like so. It should be noted, however, that if the values of the array are primitive types, we are making a copy of the array, not simply pointing to its elements, so it is different than assigning an array to another array. Now, if we want to interact with our list, we simply do so the same way we'd interact with an array. After the list name, we put opening and closing square brackets followed by the index of the list item we want to interact with, and we can retrieve or modify the value stored that way. Just like arrays, indexes for lists start at zero, and the highest index in a list is one less than the number of elements in the list. That will be the case for every instance of indexing you come across in C-sharp. Indexes always start at zero. Something to take note of. Lists don't use the length property like an array when you want to get the number of elements. Instead, lists use the property count. It works exactly the same as a length, but it's a different word, so now you know. 
Behind the scenes, the way lists are set up is that they're built on top of arrays. So you get everything that comes with arrays with some added flair. This makes lists a heavier than arrays, meaning that they consume more system resources to exist and move around. But in most cases, the added functionality you get makes that trade-off worth it. Lists can do a crazy number of things by calling methods that exist on them. And you already know how to do that. gd.print is a method call on the gd class. mylist.count is a property call on the specific list instance, mylist. So you call methods on your individual lists by typing a dot after your list's name and then the method name along with any arguments you may need to pass. Again, lists can do a lot, so I'm not going to go over every single method you can call on them. I will link the MSDN page on lists in the description though, so you can bone up whenever you're ready and able. I do want to talk about the methods that really differentiate lists from arrays though. Add, remove, insert, and remove at. You can add elements to your list using the add method. The add method adds elements to the end of your list, so the added element gets the highest index. The element added has to be the same data type as the other elements in your list. Adding, of course, increases the list's count by one. You can remove an element from your list using the remove method. The remove method removes the first occurrence of an element from your list. So if you have two of the same element, after using the remove method, you will have one of that element remaining. Removing an element causes all of the higher index elements to move one index down towards zero, and the count of the list is reduced by one. Trying to remove an element from an empty list or a list that does not contain that element will simply do nothing. There is a remove all method, but you need to pass a thing called a predicate into it, and that sort of gets confusing at this stage, so we won't be going over it, but know that it exists for later. You can add an element at a specific index of your list using the insert method. The insert method takes the index where you want to insert the element as the first argument and the element itself as the second argument. The method will insert the element at the index specified and push all displaced elements to a higher index. If you try to pass an index into the insert method that is not within the bounds of the list, you will get an argument out of range exception error. Obviously, you have to pass an element that is the same data type as other elements in the list. You can remove an element at a specific index in your list using the remove at method. The remove at method takes the index of the element you want to remove, and it will remove that element if that index exists. Removing an element will shift all higher indexed elements down one index. If the index passed is not within the range of the list, you will get an argument out of range exception error. That's lists, arrays that can shrink and grow. When you need a linear collection of elements and being able to change the size of that collection is a necessity, a list is the perfect tool. If you don't need to change the size of the collection, consider an array as it has less overhead. Homework this week is similar to last week. Take what you learned about lists today and apply them in a script. Rewrite some of the declarations you saw in this lesson, do the same operations, and see the error messages for yourself. Really dig in. Just because sending you off to do your own thing is lazy, it doesn't mean there's not some wisdom behind it. It's important you get comfortable doing things without guidance. Besides, there will be plenty of directed homework involving collections as soon as we get to control flow statements. However, there is one thing I didn't do a great job telling you about with collections during the arrays video. I sort of hoped it wouldn't come up, but then there was a comment, so I'm going to address this now. If you make a collection of objects, so any class, like a Godot node, or another collection, initializing the collection is not the same as initializing the objects within that collection. So if I declare an array like this, the array is initialized and ready to use. It knows it's only supposed to take node 2Ds. But at the moment, it isn't filled up with four node 2Ds. It's filled up with four nothings, objects that don't exist. That's because those specific objects weren't initialized. 
and objects always need to be initialized before being used. To get around this, you could do something like this. But I'll show you a better technique as we talk about looping. Now, in addition to learning some useful new tools the last couple of lessons, you've also been dealing with some weird syntax. Last lesson was square brackets galore, and now you're dealing with horizontal chevrons used in a never-before-seen way, and you're pretty sure that every time you've seen the word new, it's been used differently. I just want to take a moment to validate anyone who may be feeling that way, because this is a little weird. This is the part where you have to engage with concepts that you're not 100% comfortable with and don't 100% make sense to you yet. And nobody should be feeling behind the curve if they're a little lost at this point. Entering collections was entering new territory. And if you don't understand them until we discuss classes in depth in like four more videos, you're still well on track. So breathe easy and trust the process. Next week, we've got one final collection I want to discuss. Dictionaries. Dictionaries are a list where you can look up elements via identifier instead of simply an index. If you like what you saw here and you want to make sure to catch that, please subscribe and click the bell icon if you're into notifications. Any likes or shares helps me out tremendously, so I'd just be personally grateful for that. But sincerely, until next time, the best to you and yours. I can't wait to see you all again. Take care.